Now, our piety comes from this Latin word pietas, but our piety is a little different. We think of pious as just someone who is religious and, and you know, devotes a lot of time to prayer and worship. The Romans did that. <coughs> to them, pietas was doing the right thing. Being a good father to your children, being a good citizen to your state, being a good teacher to your students. It is, it is fulfilling your role in every capacity. So that is ethics. That is the right ethics. You're being ethical in your behavior in all capacities. So this is Augustus as pious emperor. And this is him uh, inaugurating his uh, temple. So we see all of the Romans covering their hair, head, most of them, and making a very orderly lineup to, uh, uh, to uh, he is to inaugurate the temple. Now notice the influence of Greek art. This is very much influenced by Greek sculpture. The only difference, or oh, it's not the only one, but the main difference is that whereas the Greeks would never show little fastidious, busy details, they only show the ideal, the Romans, being a practical people, are very interested in everyday um, details, such as these little kids who are bored at the ceremony. Got all bases covered. So he flees Troy and goes around looking for an arrow. His mother has appeared to him and says, you will found a mighty nation. You have to find where you have to land, and then I, a divine, you know, a goddess, I foretell that you will be the father of a mighty nation that will conquer the world. So he ex goes from Turkey, goes through the Aegean, goes through the Mediterranean Sea, finally lands in uh, Italy <laughs> and arrives in Rome. And it has been ordained that he will found and be the father of a mighty race of people who will conquer the world. So now, since a, divine, a goddess has claimed that, the Romans have the right to rule the world. So of course it's legitimate, their rule is legitimate. So here is this amazing, and this is of course Augustus, who commissioned Aeneid to create a myth about the Romans. I'll be touching upon some of the things that Jim has mentioned. So that was wonderful. You made my job easier. Um, <laughs> um, Temple of Apollo at Delphi. The Delphic Oracle, as Jim mentioned, very famous oracle, uh, that uh, kings would come, emperors would come to Delphi prior to starting a military campaign. And the most famous one was of Croesus, the king of Lydia who came to the Delphic Oracle and said, shall I invade my neighboring country? And the Oracle said, well, if you do so, you will destroy a mighty kingdom. And so he did. And he destroyed his own kingdom. So when he came back and complained, he said, well, you know, we didn't specify which kingdom, but you did destroy a mighty kingdom, your own. So the Oracle was always ambiguous. And the words of the Oracle, these women, had to be interpreted, interpreted by priests of Apollo, which gave the priests a lot of power. And that's something else that we are living with today. Um, nonetheless, what I'm talking about is also the architecture and the way that the Greeks were so sensitive to the placement of their buildings. So the temples were always placed in the landscape in a very sensitive, harmonious way which is very different from the way that the Romans would place the architecture, and we'll talk about that in May. The Romans had a tendency to dominate nature because they were that way, whereas the Greeks wanted to harmonize with nature. So always the placement of the buildings is very, very sensitive. 
There are views out to landscape. The buildings sit comfortably in the landscape. So here I'm showing you the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, which was the site of the Oracle of Apollo. Uh, and the way when you're standing in the temple, the view out to the mountains that you have. And this is the temple at Sunian. And when you stand there, you have the view to the Aegean. So because this is dedicated to the, to the god Poseidon, who is the god of the ocean. So the view to the ocean is very important. Of course, Lord Byron loved Greece, and he fought in the Greek War of Independence. So uh, there's, um, and uh, at that time, there was, uh, we didn't have the same standards about graffiti, so his name is engraved here. Uh, the sec Jim also mentioned the importance of theater, of tragedy. You see the same Temple of Apollo down here in Delphi. And because it's on a slope, you have several <coughs> terraces up. And in the, on the middle level, you have the theater because Apollo was the god of creativity. He inspired. So drama was integral to the worship of Apollo. And so the Greek theater emerged out of that uh, significance of drama and Greek culture, Greek life, and Greek religion. And this um, theater is actually all carved out of the rock. So the Greeks worked their architecture into nature. And so all the seats, and, and it's from the stone of the rock that the seats are then paved. So again, when you are uh, sitting here, you have a view to the to the to the mountains. Uh, but the best preserved Greek theater is the one at Epidaurus. Uh, this is somewhat later. This is fourth uh, century BC, and this is the way it is today. And as you can see, very little of it has been reconstructed. This is new. Just this. The rest is all ancient. And again, it's carved out of the mountain. Now, Epidaurus is dedicated to the god Asclepius, who was um, the god of healing. So this was part of a much larger sanctuary where people would go when they became ill, mentally or physically. And theater was an integral part of the healing process because of the spirituality that's explored and the psychological aspects which are explored through drama, through tragedy. So, theater, so the, what did the Greeks believe in? They believed in the harmony of body, soul, and mind. And that we find repeatedly everywhere. So at, Esclepi at Epidaurus, when you come for healing, you definitely heal your body. So there's also a stadium there. I'll show you a, a picture of a stadium, very, very important. The, the games were extremely important to the Greeks. In fact, the Olympic Games, um, as you see here, started in 776 BCE. Wars were stopped every four years if there was a war. If the Olympic Games were taking place, the wars were stopped. So the games, yes. My Where is Epidaurus? Oh, Epidaurus is in the Peloponnesus. Um, I can go back if you want it. Um, that's all right. Okay, I will show it. Uh, it's not Ionia. It's, uh, I, I'm mm -hmm. right. It's, it's a, I mean, okay. The acoustics are so mm -hmm. brilliant here that you see this, this, uh, this space is called the orchestra. Now, in Greek architecture, orchestra is not the band or the musicians. Actually, in Greek, originally, orchestra was the space, the secular space, where the, the chorus st uh, was. Because the stage, the actors, the thespian, Performers would be on the stage, which is here. But the, the, the chorus would be in the orchestra, which is here. Now that spot there, which is the center, exactly the center architecturally of this building, if you can call it a building, if you sat, stand here and whisper, literally, yes, because I've done that, mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine sitting up here, and I whispered something, and she could, when I came back, she said, what did I whisper? And she told me. And then wow. we switched. And then she stood here and whispered, and I sat there. The acoustics are phenomenal. Um, so Epidaurus uh, has, of course, the physical healing which you do in the theater. There was medicine that was given to you, herbal medicine. 
And then um, people were induced to have dreams. The belief was that the God would appear to you in your dream and tell you how you can heal yourself. So, and then of course you would go to the theater, so you would spend about three